She's a black belt in karate Working for the city She has to discipline her body Cause she knows that
Ark of the Covenant was kept in the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem until it disappeared in 587 BC. But where did it go? Adventurers, relic hunters, and even the Nazis have hunted for it, but it's never been found. Ethiopian Christians claim that it was brought to their country by Menelik, the son of the Queen of Sheba, who stole it from King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. So what exactly was it? According to the Bible, the Ark could be a powerful weapon. When it was carried into the River Jordan, it said that the waters parted. And when the Ark was paraded around the walls of the city of Jericho, they were shaken to the ground. If we follow the history of the Ark into battle situations or an inadvertent touching of it when it was being carried across the river by a man who meant no harm but was struck dead. I think that some of the descriptions might lead us to believe that there were plates of metal rather like a very high-powered battery. So perhaps if the Ark was technology rather than magic, but technology from the Lord alone knows where, then it might have been able to give out electric shocks. I could imagine if you were carrying an arc out in the sunlight, bright sunlight, you know, in the Middle East, you're going to get a high charge on that, that arc. And if someone comes out who's, who's earthed and touches it, he's going to get one hell of an electric shock, which could kill him, could possibly stop his heart. So there could be some truth in that story. Padin Aram or Padin Aram Aramaic was an early Aramean kingdom in Mesopotamia. Padin Aram in Aramaic means the field of Aram. The name may correspond to the Hebrew Seda Aram or field of Aram. In the Hebrew Bible, Padin Aram designates the area of Haran in Upper Mesopotamia. Padin Aram and Haran may be dialectical variations regarding the same locality as Pad Anu and Haran who are synonyms for road or caravan. Root in Akkadian Padin Aram or Padin appears in 11 verses in the Hebrew Bible, all in Genesis. Adherents of the documentary hypothesis of natural attribute most of these verses to the priestly source and the remainder to a later redactor. The city of Haran, where Abraham and his father Terah settled after leaving her of the Chaldees, while en route to Canaan, according to the Genesis chapter 11 verse 31, was located in Padan Aram, that part of Aram Naphraim that lay along the Euphrates. Abraham's brother Nahor settled in the area. Abraham's nephew Bethuel, son of Nahor, and Milcar, and father of Laban and Rebekah, lived in Padan Aram. Abraham sent his steward Akva to find a wife among his kinfolk for his son Isaac. The steward found Rebekah. Isaac and Rebekah's son Jacob was sent there to avoid the wrath of his brother Esau. The Jacob worked for Laban, fathered eleven sons and daughter Dinah, and amassed livestock and wealth. For that, Jacob went to Shechem and the land of Israel, where his twelfth son was born to him. In rabbinic interpretation, in the Midrash, Rabbi Isaac taught that the people of Padan Aram were rogues and Rebekah was like a lily among the thorns. Song of Songs Rabbi 2-4 Zohar, Bereshit 1-136b, Rashi to Jen. 25 to 20, Rabbi Isaac thus considered Rebekah's sojourn in Padin Aram as emblematic of Israel's among the nation. Ramesses II, commonly referred to as Ramesses the Great, or the Great Ancestor, was the third Egyptian pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramesses II is celebrated as one of the greatest pharaohs in ancient Egyptian history. Ramesses II ascended to the throne in his late teens after his father's death. He was engaged in several military campaigns early in his reign in an effort to retrieve territories held by the Nubians and the Hittites. After defeating Sheridan Sea Pirates in a naval battle near the mouth of the River Nile, Ramesses II launched his first campaign into Canaan. 
By the fourth year of his reign, Ramesses captured the Hittite vassal state of Amuru. The following year, Ramesses II sought to expand Egypt's frontiers into modern-day Syria at the Battle of Kadesh. He ordered tens of thousands of soldiers to modern-day Lebanon, Syria, Israel and Palestine, which then belonged to a more substantial enemy than he had ever faced, the Hittite Empire. The Egyptian armies were ambushed and outnumbered at Kadesh, but the pharaoh and his armies stalemated the army and returned home as heroes. Ramesses II decorated many monuments with inscriptions describing the campaign and battle as an unprecedented victory. A few years later he returned in a third Syrian campaign. Ramesses II split his army into two forces. He led one force into Jerusalem and Jericho, and the second force was led by his firstborn son, amon her Kepeshef, the son of Ramesses' first wife, Nefertari. By the tenth year of his reign he returned to Hittite territory once again and laid siege to towns in Retinu and Tunip in Naharin. Neither side could decisively defeat the other in battle, eventually leading to a proposed peace treaty with the Hittite king of Kadesh, Hattusili III. The peace treaty between the Egyptian and Hittite empires was recorded both in Egyptian hieroglyphics and Akkadian, in cuneiform script. Together they make up the oldest peace treaty in world history. He restored traditional Egyptian religious culture before Amenhotep IV changed it into something closer to a monotheistic religion, where the sun god Aten was worshipped over all other gods. After reigning for 30 years, Ramesses II celebrated a jubilee called the Sed Festival and was ritually transformed into a god. He had brought peace, solidified Egyptian borders and built many monuments across his empire. Ramesses II had made Egypt rich during his 66-year reign, and by the time of his death, aged around 90 years, he had outlived many of his wives and supposed 100 sons and daughters. Ramesses II was originally buried in the Valley of the Kings, but was moved several times and is located today in Cairo's Egyptian Museum. Going outside the spacecraft uh, is really a very special thing. I mean, we knew we could do it, but the bosses and the design team want you demonstrating that you weren't going to flop around and poke holes in your suit with the antennas and things like that. Two, one, zero. All engines running. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff. So Dave Scott over in the command module was photographing uh, with a movie camera. And I got no more than about three or four feet up the handrail um, on the front of the lunar module when Dave said, hey, hold it, uh, the camera jam. Let me try and fix it. So Jim McDivitt, who's the commander, says, okay, Dave, I can give you five minutes to try and fix it, and Rusty, stay right where you are. So I figured, hey, great, this is my opportunity to really appreciate what's, what's going on. So I just let go with one hand and just sort of swung around, looked at the earth below and the black space above and the sun over my shoulder. And I mean, it was this incredible, spectacular view. You have to realize that in that Apollo suit, uh, the radio was voice operated. So when you weren't talking, it was totally silent. And when you're not moving in the suit, when you're just hanging, you're not even aware of the suit. It's floating and you're floating inside it, like you're naked in space. The, the view out the helmet is totally unobstructed. It was a time when I said, okay, I'm just going to be a human being here and look at what's happening. How did I get here? Humanity has reached this point where we're moving out from the earth. You know, I'm a small part of that, but that's what's going on. And how, how does that happen in history? And what does it mean? And when I say, how did I get here? Who, who am I? What am, am I me or am I us? You know, that, that is very clear that you're there as a representative of humankind. This is, this is humanity moving out, and you're just the representative, uh, you know, on that frontier. <laughs>